You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. This is Lecture 3 of the collection of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Approaching the Mystery of Golgotha. Lecture 3 is entitled The Michael Impulse and the Mystery of Golgotha, Part 1, given in Stuttgart, May 18, 1913. On my last visit here, I presented in two lectures some aspects of the life between death and a new birth. A perspective was chosen that kept in view the overall significance and meaning of a knowledge of the life between death and a new birth, because the forces and beings a person comes into contact with there also reach into our life that runs its course between birth and death. Today I want to begin with a wide-ranging discussion that can bring before our eyes the great mission of the anthroposophical worldview in the context of the whole character of our present cultural period. As I have often discussed in considerable depth, we are in an important segment of human development on earth. I have emphasized quite often that even though in an admittedly superficial consideration of the evolution of humankind on earth, one frequently calls every period a period of transition, nevertheless, from a certain point of view, one must call our period, if not exactly a transitional period, then a significant period for the entire development of humanity. An initial perspective I would like to give, I would like to place before you, is one I have often mentioned. In this context, we must acknowledge, as always, the reality that even though its results can be studied only by the trained soul of the spiritual researcher, anthroposophy, which we know must live its way into the human cultural life of today through necessities inherent in the development of the earth, can be understood by any human soul, provided it is willing and brings sufficient open-mindedness to the subject. Here the objection can easily be raised that only a few people have the kind of consciousness such that what anthroposophy speaks of seems true to them. Moreover, the majority of people consider whatever comes from spiritual science, from spiritual research, to be pure make-believe, dreaming, if not quite as we heard yesterday, one of the seven sects of perdition. What is really at the bottom of this? Given that very many people still say that they cannot understand anthroposophy, that it seems to them to be pure make-believe, is it possible to maintain that this truth, understood by few, is still knowable by unprejudiced common sense? In yesterday's public lecture I dealt with the problems of how one can arrive at supersensible knowledge, how one can liberate certain soul forces from their penetration into the physical. I mentioned how the forces of thinking, speech, and will can become free, can emancipate themselves from the physical, so that they can function purely in the sphere of the soul and spirit, and that they are powers that can be trained through meditation, concentration, and contemplation, and can then penetrate the supersensible worlds. All the forces that enable one to penetrate the supersensible worlds derive from the human ability to release the soul from everything we are tied to in a physical body. Therefore, in the powers of knowledge with which the supersensible worlds can be researched, we are dealing with soul forces that are free of the body. Now, in ordinary everyday life, the soul already has a power that contains what the other soul forces strive for in spiritual science. This soul power is the power of thinking, as it is expressed in ordinary, unpretentious, common-sense human understanding. This power of ordinary thinking in particular can show itself under certain circumstances to be free of the body without being developed any further. Ordinary thinking, which every soul today has within it as a power, has this special feature. It has two faces. It is Janus-headed. On the one hand, ordinary thinking is dependent on the brain and brings to consciousness only what is reflected in the brain, the nervous system. In that case, it is more passive, desiring to lean on the instrument of the brain. On the other hand, this same thinking can, without any kind of meditation, by quite simply rousing itself from within, becoming conscious of itself in its true nature, tear itself away from its dependency on the brain, free itself. Then it is a more active thinking. 
Both are sides of healthy human thinking that every soul today can enjoy. Thinking is in every soul, but it can be used in a twofold way. First, human beings can gather strength in themselves and mint thoughts within themselves, in which case thinking is active and can fully engage everything, apparently even the boldest assertions of spiritual science. But when thinking does not wish to gather strength, does not wish to pull itself together in its activity, then it must lean on the instrument of thinking, the brain, and then it brings forth only thoughts that can be grasped by the instrument of the brain. In this case, the person is no longer thinking actively, but is thinking passively. The division between active thinkers and passive thinkers is more important than any other dichotomy, not for the present, however, but for the future. Those who can form independent, free thinking in themselves, who can think actively, will be pushed forward by the force of this thinking to spiritual scientific research. Those who are not willing to think actively, but rather only in dependence on the brain, will say that anthroposophical research is make-believe, because they wish to be devoted to the instrument of the brain, and have no idea of what can be encompassed by an act of thinking that is free. One could say they do not wish to think on their own, only to have the thinking done within them for their own benefit. Precisely from this perspective, one's adherence to and behavior toward the anthroposophical worldview today is basically a matter of either inner industriousness, inner strengthening on the one hand, or of inner love of comfort, inner laziness on the other. Thinking that is willing to work hard, to strengthen itself, grasps the results of anthroposophy. Thinking that wants to avail itself of a crutch, that wants to bring thoughts to consciousness merely in the reflection of the brain, Thinking that wants to be comfortable and wants only to let thinking go on within itself will find it necessary from its love of ease to reject anthroposophical research. All the philosophies and scribbling that flow into the world with the appearance of a scientific and intellectual character, claiming that one cannot understand what anthroposophical research can create, rest on a deep-seated unconscious love of comfort which does not want to become active, but rather to remain passive. Adherence to the anthroposophical worldview is not comfortable. That is the basic truth of the matter. If you go to meetings where people, who no longer call themselves materialistic but perhaps monistic, hold forth on the fantasies of spiritual science, you will find that there is a good deal more to it than what is actually said in those meetings. At the foundation of such people's attitude lies the inability to progress to active thinking, And beyond that there is the arrogance, because they will not pull themselves up to active thinking, of making the comfort of passive thinking the highest principle of human research. The role of comfort in the use of soul forces leads in ordinary life to something one can observe quite often. Those who wish to hear this or that speech, yet are too devoted to comfort to follow the arguments, eventually doze off and sleep through what they actually came to find out or perhaps not what they came to find out. This sort of sleeping will have to be dealt with through the... Let me read that again. This sort of sleeping will have to be dealt with through the necessary developmental impulses of humanity by all those people who can pull themselves together for active thinking in the present and in the near future. Some will sleep through something of the highest importance, but even though they want to know nothing about it, behind what transpires in our sense world, there are supersensible beings endowed with power, supersensible processes. For that reason, although a part of humanity wishes to sleep through what is actually happening, in our present epoch we are dealing with important supersensible processes. Important supersensible processes are at stake in our age. And all sensory processes are the outer forms of supersensory processes. If we look through the veil, so to speak, in which all sensory processes of development show themselves in our epoch, we pass behind the veil of the supersensory processes. Moreover, to characterize the supersensory processes that are particularly important now, we must remind ourselves that all life in the universe rests on an ever-growing process of development. If we pursue the human path of development, we first find human beings in the ancient Saturn period in accordance with their initial constitution. We then find them imbued with a new element in the ancient sun period, still 
further developed in the ancient moon period and endowed with the fourth element, the capital I, in the earth period. And we certainly know that in the Jupiter period human soul forces will assume such a form that human beings will make themselves comparable to the hierarchy of the angels. As humanity progresses in its development and rises, other beings of the individual hierarchies rise from lower to higher levels. Not only the human hierarchy undergoes such an ever-rising development, but also the hierarchies that stand above the human. Let us take from these hierarchies the one standing two levels above human beings, the hierarchy of the archangels. I said yesterday that from many understandable points of view, people are not particularly offended if someone speaks of spirit in general, but if one goes into classes, orders, and individuals as one does with plants, animals, and other fields of natural science, our contemporary cultured person is deeply offended. Nonetheless, one must speak in this way if we are to deal with the supersensible world in a concrete fashion. If you pick up the cycle of lectures I gave in Christiania on the development of different peoples, you will see that their development is related to the hierarchy of the archangels, the archai, the primal forces, the spirits of personality, lie behind the successive epochs. If we now take the most important beings from the rank of the archangels, we have names that we run into in other situations, names that we have met before, Raphael, Gabriel, Michael, and so forth. We can name these beings with such names because the name is not at all essential. We give them names in the same way that we provide other things with names. They play a certain role in what we find is the facts of supersensible development upon which our development in the sense world depends. Using the methods of spiritual science, we can in fact differentiate very well between the individual beings in the hierarchy of the archangels, not abstractly, but by merely picking names, but rather so that we can see the principal cultural impulses that manifest themselves externally in the sense world. For example, we can investigate a spot of land in the first century after Christ and see it to be ruled by a different being from the one that ruled the principal cultural impulses among the leading peoples in the 12th or 13th centuries or the one that rules in our own cultural development. Let us first consider our own cultural development. In this case, we must clearly distinguish the age that began in the 15th or 16th century. Its principal signature is the rise of the natural sciences, and it brought the natural sciences to the stature we find in the 19th century, which cannot be admired enough. If we take an overall view of these centuries of humankind's work in natural science, we must say that this work was led by certain peoples who were led from within the spiritual worlds by a quite particular being from the hierarchy of the archangels. And this being is quite precisely distinct from the being who presently leads our nascent cultural epoch from the supersensible world. If we wish to give the names current in the Western world for these leading beings from the hierarchy of the archangels, we can say that starting from the time of Christ, various beings were the leaders of culture as it progressed. Without wishing to harp on these names, I will only enumerate, just as one runs to the names of people who participate in whatever process on the physical level. The names from the rank of beings and the hierarchy of the archangels who have ruled the progress of culture. Oriphiel, Anael, Zachariel, Raphael, Samael, Gabriel, Michael. Gabriel was the leading spirit in the cultural period that has ended in the spiritual world during the last third of the 19th century. Indeed, in the last third of the 19th century, an epoch began, as has become more and more obvious, in which quite different influences and impulses flowed down from the supersensible world into the sense world. While, formerly, human souls were predominantly directed toward what the senses see and reason can grasp, people of the age now coming who do not wish to sleep through the development as it progresses, will have to pay attention more and more to how supersensible wisdom and knowledge makes its way from the supersensible world into earthly sense-bound development. <clears throat> if one wishes to characterize this superficially, one could say that in the epoch that has just ended, the supersensible beings had enough to do to keep the inspirations and intuitions that can flow in from the supersensible worlds away from physical life. 
The hierarchy played a role in preventing such intuitions and inspirations from flowing into souls. From now on, the supersensible forces will be directed and led from within the supersensible world so that as many inspirations and intuitions as possible can flow into human souls. As a result, the human soul will be able to comprehend imagination, inspiration and intuition. The truly living cultural impulses of the present age will be just as full of the inspired and the intuitive as the age that has elapsed was empty of any inspired nature, any knowledge of the spiritual. It would have been impossible to say to people fifty years ago what, through the necessary course of world development, can be said to you today, because it would have been impossible then to receive these things from the spiritual worlds on earth. The door has now been opened, and just as the past age was most favorable for the development of reason, the next age will be very favorable for the development of inspiration and intuition. Two ages are colliding hard, one that was disinclined to all inspiration and one in which, although mighty forces will fight against all inspiration, it will be possible again to take up inspiration and make it set the tone for human souls. If we look further into the matter, we will discover that the supersensible powers that could not flow directly into human souls in the last epoch were not quite inactive. What external physiology cannot prove is still truth. In the age of Gabriel, work emanating from within the supersensible worlds into the sense-bound world worked on the human physical body. During this time, fine structures were created within the frontal lobes of the brain that were eventually implanted by the reign of Gabriel into human generation, so that people are now born for the most part with a brain having different, finer structures in the frontal lobes than was the case with people of the 12th and 13th centuries. To create these structures was the task of the Gabriel age in which people directed their intelligence toward the physical and the sense-bound and were closed to the inspired, so that the impulses of the supersensible world poured into physicality and formed this delicate structure in the brain. Increasingly the structure will be present in people who will therefore feel themselves capable of moving forward to active thinking and to the understanding of spiritual science. In our epoch at whose beginning we now stand. The supersensible powers will not be used to form structures in the brain, but rather to flow directly into human souls, to have an effect through imagination and inspiration. This is the reign of Micaiah. Thus two beings in the ranks of the archangels differentiate themselves. One, Gabriel, led humankind directly before our age and worked on the finer construction of the brain. The other, the archangel who is now beginning to work, does not have the task of modifying a human organ, but rather of planting an understanding of spiritual science in human souls. This is how we can distinguish beings belonging to the hierarchy of the archangels. In these two examples I am seeking to place before you concrete character traits of these two beings. We cannot be satisfied only with names. Just as we know nothing about a person whose name is Miller, we know nothing about Gabriel if we know only his name. On the other hand, we know something about a person if we can say he is a sympathetic person, he has done this or that. In this way we also know something about a supersensible being when we can say that he made forces flow into the physical human body, forces that made certain structures in the frontal lobes come into being through the human power of generation. Moreover, we characterize the spirit, the being, who followed him correctly when we refer to his activity in extending the understanding for inspired and intuitive truths. Michael is at work not so much for the spiritual researcher, the initiate, as for those now and in the centuries to come, who as the powers of active thinking concentrate more and more in humanity, wish to understand spiritual science, who desire to make the transition into active thinking. This transition is important in yet another respect. Through what happened in it, a new humanity is in the process of forming, which through its organization will be in a position in future incarnations to look back through memory to earlier incarnations. 
However, humanity must first put itself in this position. One cannot remember something one has never thought about. If in the evening a man thoughtfully takes off his cuffs and puts down his cufflinks, he will not find them the next morning. Excuse me. If in the evening a man thoughtlessly takes off his cuffs and puts down his cufflinks, he will not find them in the morning because he has not given it any thought. If he takes the idea of stamping the image of the cufflinks surroundings into himself, the next morning he will go straight to the place where he left them. This anecdote is not only valid for ordinary life in respect to our capacity for memory, but it is also relevant to an experience of earlier lives. We must first recall the deepest inner being of the soul, that which really passes over into the nature of the soul. But for this we must first have grasped this innermost being, which we can only do through esoteric training. If one has not made the effort to have thoughts about the nature of the soul in the earlier incarnation, one cannot remember it, no matter how well organized one may be. Although people will be organized for remembering, they will at first feel this organization as an illness, as nervousness, as a dreadful state, if they are unable to use it. They will be organized to exercise recollection, but they will have nothing to remember. If people have impressions they cannot turn to account, organs they cannot use, then they fall ill. Compare this with the observation that people in future ages will be organized to remember earlier lives on earth, but that only those will remember who have something to remember, who have recognized through occult training the nature of the human soul and its unique quality as a part of the spiritual world. In every life that follows a life of the sort in which one has recognized the soul as a spiritual being, there will be recollection of previous lives. So we stand at an important turning point. Understanding spiritual science means fundamentally nothing other than having a feel for this turning point in our time. Now, not all beings belonging to the hierarchy of the archangels are similarly constructed, equal in rank. When we speak of the hierarchy of the archangels, we can say that one takes over from another, as I have said. However, the highest in rank, likewise the superior, is Michael, the one who begins to assume the leadership in our time. He is from the circle of the archangels, but he is in a certain way the most advanced. A process of development is now going on and embraces all beings. All beings are in a process of growth, and we live in the age in which Michael, the highest being of archangelic nature, is making the transition to the nature of an archai. He will gradually move into a leading position, will become the time spirit, the leading being for all of humanity. That is what is significant. It is tremendously important in our time that we understand that what is not yet present in all previous epochs was not available for all humanity, can now be and must become the property of all humanity. What until now appeared among human indiv- what until now appeared among individual peoples, spiritual reflection, is now accessible for the whole human race. Moreover, just as we can speak of what is happening behind the world of the senses, we can also speak of what is transpiring in the realm of the senses as an external expression of what has just been described, that in a way an exaltation of the archangel Michael is taking place in the spiritual world. Until now a human being could be a personality. In the future a human being will also be able to be a personality, but in a different way than has been possible up to now. Human beings have always, to a certain extent, participated in the supersensible world. At least they were able to do so with their soul life. But the personal needs and personal coloring that people experienced in the sense world did not come down from above, but from below, upward. It came from Lucifer. Lucifer created personality. Hence, up until now, one could have said that human beings could not penetrate into the supersensible world, could not bring their personalities into the spiritual world. They had to extinguish their personalities, otherwise they polluted the spiritual world. In the future, however, human beings will have to let their personalities be inspired from above, so that they can take up what should flow from the spiritual world. The personality will receive its distinctive stamp to what it can take up in the way of spiritual knowledge. The personality will become something very different in future times. To a certain extent, human beings in earlier times were personalities through what steered them away from the spiritual, 
to what was pushed up into them from the body. In the future, however, they will have to become personalities through what they can assimilate from the spiritual world, through what they can take up into themselves. Through their blood, their temperament, and many sorts of things that come from below, people were actually personalities in the past, and impersonal elements radiated in into these personalities from the supersensible. In the future, one will be less and less able to be a personality through temperament, blood, and so forth. But one will be able to be a personality through participation in the supersensible world. That which contains supersensible impulses will flow into character. This will aid the impulse of Michael, who leads the understanding of spiritual life right into the human soul. People in the future with a pronounced character of personality will possess this character of personality from the fact that they express this or that through understanding of the supersensible worlds. The Alexanders, Caesars, and Napoleons belong to the past. <clears throat> supersensible elements did indeed flow into them, but their high personal coloring came from what they received from below. People, personalities, will now be formed by the way they carry the spiritual world down into the world of the senses. The people who carry personality into humanity from within the soul will be the personalities who will succeed the Alexanders, Caesars, and Napoleons. The strength of human deeds in the future will be produced by the strength of the spiritual elements that flow into these human deeds. All this is part of what is significant about the transition from one epoch to the other. But just what is it that characterizes the most significant transition, the transition from the epoch of Gabriel to the epoch of Michael in our period of development? What we have said today can perfectly well be understood with common sense if we are sufficiently free from prejudice to look into our time and see how two possibilities collide right up to the last third of the nineteenth century. The first possibility is to build a picture of the world from natural science. Today that is out of date. It is antiquated. It no longer fits in the character of the period. People still do it because they tend to carry on what comes from old times. The other possibility, which fits in the character of our period, is to construct, is to construct a world view from the inspirations and understanding of the spiritual world. We must take up that possibility as a feeling or sensitivity in our soul. If we do so, then we will learn what the anthroposophical worldview means for individual souls and learn to feel what development is for humanity. We will then be permitted to be participants in something significant. Now let me remind you of something I wove into the lectures I gave here the last time, the lectures about the alteration in the function of Buddha. It also is a point that should be linked to what will be said in the next lecture. Therefore, I would like to close with a question, with a question that can arise in every soul and will lead us from the important issue examined today to something yet more important. When an exaltation of Michael has taken place, when he has become the leading spirit of Western culture, who takes his place? The place must be filled. Every soul must say to itself, now an angel must have experienced a promotion, an exaltation, and must enter the rank of the archangels. Who is it? I wish to close with this question, to lead over into still more important observations that will occupy us the day after tomorrow. Today I wanted to place before your souls the most important characteristics of the transition, the fact that the souls who can pull themselves up to it can find an understanding of supersensible truths. For the world forces that stand behind humanity and lead its evolution wish it so. And the picture of this in the sense world is that personality takes on an entirely different nuance. While in the bygone age temperament and blood gave personality its color from below, the element of spiritual understanding will give the pitch for personality in the new age. That will be the tone-giving element. It is important to understand this, but even more important to feel it. From this point, the day after tomorrow, we will move to a significant observation that can penetrate each one of our souls. The end of Lecture 3